Number one, always aim for a specific response. Always aim for a specific response. Yeah, I, I just wonder sometimes whether our, our messages need to be more like kind of a, a bullet. They're, they're, they're really clear. We're, we're clear about what we're speaking about and, and what we're looking for. Um, the most important question after you've studied the text is this. What specific response am I going to ask for? What specific response am I going to ask for? And that really needs to come out of the text. You know, we're, we're reading this. What, what specific response is, is this text challenging me to make? And, and let's be specific. Um, sum is not a number. <laughs> more is not an amount. It's not just a question of we need to do this sum, sum of this or more. We need to be, why not be specific? Um, that clarity. What do I want them to think? What do I want them to feel? What do I want them to do? Think, feel, do. Clarify behavioral objectives. If I was a teacher in a school, I would need to do a lesson plan. Okay, if I was teaching in a, in a secular school, every lesson would, would need to have a plan. And at the top of that plan, there is an objective. What I'm saying is, why don't we just make things clear? What, what, what? As I read the text, what is God saying through the text? What, what are some of the, the objectives which come out of this? Two, model it from your own life. Model it from your own life. Now, I think this is a, this is a big thing. When I preach, I tend to, to say, not you, but we. So, because I think the temptation is, as the preacher, I'm standing above people, I'm saying, you, 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 you. And that kind of fits in with that impression which most people have, that the, the, the lady or the woman preaching is above contradiction, and they're telling you what to do. It's better to say, we because we're all in this together. We all come underneath God's word. We, we all want God to speak to us, including the preacher, especially the preacher. So I, I, I'm very careful, it's we, we're all in this together. You see, I'm, part, I'm only a member of one church, and that's St. John's Duckenford. I might be the pastor, but I'm a member of the church too. I've been a member of that church for 22 years. It's the longest I've ever been in one place in my life. <laughs> I'm a part of that family. I, I have shared memories. That's where my best friends are. You know, I've, I've, I've shared tears and I've shared joy. I'm we. It's just a small thing, but it's a big thing. We. Paul says, now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us. I don't have to be perfect. I just need to be humble and a step ahead. Speed of the leader, speed of the team, actually there. Speed of the leader, speed of the team. It's gonna be very difficult for a church to grow beyond the maturity of the pastor, of the leader. But at the same time, uh, there is that sense that we're all in this together. So, you know, model it from your own life. But then, you know, that's the, that's the exciting thing, isn't it? But that we've done all of this work. I, I'm just amazed that I get paid to study God's word. <laughs> I get paid to do that. I get paid to pray. A pastor should never take that for granted. What a joy! I get chance to, to study and to meditate upon God's Word. And, and, and therefore, of all people, I want God's Word to transform me so that when I stand up, I, I just come thinking, God has been telling me and, sh and showing me so many things and I want to share this with you. It's not a question of you, you've got to do this. God is, by his grace, wants to speak to us 
out of his word. I, I say this to my people. When you experience, you know, God speaking to you, all I can say is, and people look at me as if I'm mad, but I say, you will know that when you meet God on a daily basis and he speaks to you from his word in, in, a, in a powerful way, that will sustain you. It will sustain you for days and days and days. That's not an excuse for not meeting God every day. But you, do you know what I mean by that? Haven't you experienced that in your life? You, God has spoken to you through his word. And wow! And you're going to carry that through. So anyway, there we go. Model it from your own life. Three, ask penetrating questions. I like this. Ask penetrating questions. Now, I, I, I said before, this is a rabbinic style of teaching. In the West, a teacher, as I'm doing now, regurgitates information. And most of what I say, you will forget, frankly, um, which is why you've got a handout. There will be a few things you will remember, but most will forget. In Jesus' day, the rabbinic style of education was asking questions. So the rabbi would just basically ask questions and it would be a way of making sure um, the student understood and could apply what the teacher was saying. Can you remember at school? I, okay, I'll say this. I'll, I'll be honest. I was at school and then when the teacher taught something and then you know the teacher was going to ask questions and you always kept your head down. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. <laughs> But Jesus' style of teaching, the rabbinic style of teaching, it was asking questions. And, and actually there are a load of examples there um, of, of Jesus asking questions. But I was reading Romans the other day, and Paul actually was doing the same in Romans. Um, um, Romans, he does this again and again. Romans chapter 3. Then what advantage has the Jew? Question mark. Or what is the value of circumcision? Question mark. Much in every way. But then he goes, verse 3, what if some were unfaithful? Question mark. Does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? Question mark. By no means. Um, verse 5, if our unrighteousness serve to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Question mark. So actually, Paul does the same. It's, it's a very rabbinic style and also asking questions again if you're speaking to a group and I'm thinking of my culture I can also ask questions which I know people are thinking so if I know that there are people there who are thinking other things I can actually raise those as questions and answer them and that seems to be quite a cool way of speaking sometimes it's like a lawyer, isn't it? You know, a lawyer in, in a court of law will ask all sorts of questions um, to be able to, to prove, a, prove a case, uh, which means we need to get into the mindset of the people we're speaking to. What are the questions people have? What are the questions people have? Give specific action steps for. In other words, we need to show how it can be done. I, so often, you know, in, in church we say, you know, we should pray more, we should witness more, we should give more, we should forgive more, we should love more. People are saying, yes, but how? Yes, but how? Um, the, the, the danger is we just make people feel guilty. If you're dealing with Christians, most Christians know that they're not praying as much as they should do. So a sermon on preaching, uh, on prayers designed, it, it, it's just going to make people feel guilty. You don't want to make people feel guilty. You want to encourage them, show them how. I'll give you an example. Forgiveness. I need to recognize that if I'm speaking, when Jesus speaks about forgiveness, how we should forgive others, that for some people, it might be easier for me to tell them, climb Mount Everest. So for some people, who are sitting there, and I know some of their life stories, I know what's happened to them, humanly speaking, it would be easier for me to say to them, climb Mount Everest than forgive. 
forgiveness is 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 there was a the, the London bombings, uh, the tube seven. bombing. Yeah, um, there was a, a a a young girl killed, and her mother was a, a Anglican clergy person, a vicar. And she was honest enough to realize that she couldn't say the Lord's Prayer anymore. You know the where it says. F yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. She couldn't say it. Um, now, actually, uh, there was something about her grasp of Jesus, maybe, but she was honest enough to realize that she couldn't say that. That's honest, isn't it? We need a bit more honesty sometimes. Because we need to realize that things happen sometimes which are so horrendous. So I think forgiveness is a good example. I think forgiveness, in, in the extreme case, there's a stage, there, there's a journey. And, and maybe wise preaching, we need to say, actually, there are, there's, a, there's a journey there. Jesus still calls us to forgive, um, but there's a journey there. But also, it's not just something we do. It, it goes back to the gospel, the, the foundation, the, 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 the starting point of us forgiving others is realizing that Jesus has forgiven me. And that's the gospel thing, isn't it? We still give action steps, as an example, I think sometimes. How do, how do I forgive others? But the, th this is not just moralistic. It, it's rooted in what God has done for us in Jesus, and that's, that's where the gospel is. Anyway, specific action steps. Give practical examples. Give practical examples. Um, and I, I think the Bible gives us many examples. Hebrews 11 is a great example if you're talking about faith. Hebrews 11 gives us great examples of people who had faith. Um, the things that happened to these people are examples. They were written down to teach us. I think also sometimes it's cool to make heroes of the people we want to copy. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we were doing a series, this is many years ago. Um, it was probably something, The Secrets of Deep Relationships or something. And I had a, a couple in the church, they'd been married for, they were celebrating either 50 or 60 years, I forget, I think it was probably 50 years. And during the series they said, look, um, we, we want to thank God for our marriage and, and we'd like, um, can, can, can we have a blessing in church? And I said, yes, why don't we do that during this series? And we'll do it in front of, do you mind? No. So we did, we did some teaching, you know, how do you have relationships that stand the test of... And then I said, here's Derek and Elsie, 50 years. Yeah! And they are examples of this. And then we, we prayed for them. You made their personal for them. Yeah. You know, yeah. So you flesh these things out. By the way, and when Elsie died, I'll never forget this. I, will, I always say, I want to die like Elsie died. Um, when we went, they'd been going to church all their lives, and, um, but they became Christians soon after we arrived. They said, we have been going to church all our lives, but we never knew Jesus. We do now. I wish we'd found this out sooner. And they loved Jesus. Um, but um, Elsie got sick, she, she was ill, and then um, she was rushed into hospital, um, heart attack. And she was um, in, in her bed, and, and I rushed up. I, I was around, so I, I rushed up. The family were there, and, and the doctor said she hasn't got long to live. She hasn't got long to live. So the family were there, and as I laid my hand out on her to pray for her, she stopped me, and she prayed for me. And she prayed for all of the family. And, and I thought, I want to die like that too, yeah? She, she, she thought about other people, and rather than the pastor praying for her, she, she just about to meet Jesus, she started to pray for us. Wow! Now that's an example, isn't it? You're going to remember that one, um, because it's a model. So we need to, to, to use people who flesh this out, give practical examples. Offer people hope. I think this is so important. I, I come across people often with so little hope. They've struggled with issues, and they've struggled with issues all of their lives, and in the, in the end they just feel that things will never change. 
It's the gospel that brings hope. Things can change, things can be different. People cannot exist on a diet of despair. All sorts of research has been done um, during <coughs> World War II. Uh, there was a lot of stuff done on people in the concentration camps. And the people who died um, first were people who had no hope. People who lived were people who had hope. Hope keeps you alive, physiologically. Um, so we need to offer uh, people hope. Um, I think that's important, isn't it? Leadership, I think one of the, uh, as a leader, as a pastor in a church, one of my most important roles is to, to paint a vision of how life can be. Yeah? This is how things can be. Now, so often preachers are basically saying, you shouldn't do this, you're really bad people, la, 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 la. That, well, actually, I think most people know that. Why not just say, Jesus, the gospel, the power of the gospel can actually, you can reimagine, it helps you reimagine how life can be, how life should be. And we need to do more of that in our preaching, I think. Make your application your points. This is a big thing. Make your application your points. And we'll, we'll think a little bit about that in a second. I think this is the secret weapon of effective preaching, where you make your points your application. So, for instance, you know, um, so often what we hear, we hear a preacher and they go through a passage of scripture and there are three points which describe the text. But why not make those points your applications? And we'll, we'll, we'll look at this in a minute. Um, make your applications your points and your points your applications. So that if I had a message and it had three points and those points were my applications, if I looked at those three points, I would see immediately what this message is about. Make your points your applications, your applications your points. And, and as a way of doing that, maybe put a verb in every point. A verb is a doing word. Okay? So that we see things to do. And it makes, easy, it, makes it easier for people to, to be doers of the word. Nine, put Jesus or God in the point. Yeah, um, I think, again, the, the danger, there is a danger here. It just becomes moral advice. We need to watch that. But... In the end, this is not about self-help. This is not self-help. If you type in, Frank, you will find on Amazon all sorts of self-help books. Sometimes they can be helpful. All truth is God's truth. I'll repeat that. All truth is, if it's true, it's therefore by definition God's truth. And so you can pick up all sorts of things. But ultimately, this is salvation help. And that's very different. It's not just about us trying to be better human beings, though there is an element of that, don't get me wrong. Ultimately, this is about something Jesus does within us. Um, and, and sometimes that just, that helps us. Um, here's an example from 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Overcoming temptation. Um, there's the text. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you t be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. So, uh, you can overcome temptation. This is, this is a slightly weaker outline. Because it is common, it is limited, it is escapable. Now, those three points link in with the text. But, what would be a better outline would be what to do when you're tempted. Oh, yeah. That makes it more personal, doesn't it? So what do you do when you're tempted? One, believe God has seen it before. Two, believe God will limit its intensity. Three, believe God will make a way out. Three Bs. Three Bs. Can you see the example there? It's not just a description of the text, which the first one was. It's actually, it's action-oriented. It's to do with application. It's, it's those points that are applying the text. 
and it's it's limited to the it's it's linked to the gospel. This is something God wants to do in us. Number ten, and I've already talked about this. Personalize the points by using personal pronouns. Personalize the points by using personal pronouns. That's you, me, and I. Jesus came for me. Jesus died for me. Jesus is coming again for me. Yeah, makes it personal. It just reminds us this is about the gospel, not just about us trying to be better human beings. Now, you, you can't force that. So you don't have what I'm saying is that's what we want to do. But it has to fit. It has to fit. Let's think of some examples. This is from one Corinthians. This is an academic outline. Um, the source of the Corinthians gifts, the function of the Corinthians gifts, the purpose of the Corinthians gifts. That's a common outline. It's a lecture outline. When you open your study Bible, um, there will be a, a broader outline, often of a book. And um, that's great. That's, but we want, this to, we want to apply these truths to people's lives. So what's wrong with this outline? Firstly, it's abstract. It's impersonal. It is past tense. And it's neither about God or people. It's just a kind of a, a, a description of the text. It's a good description of the text. But we want to apply this. God's word, people's need together in application. Just start thinking about what you're going to be doing when you come up with a topic, when you, you see what God's word says. How can I make my outline like this here's a life-changing outline using your gifts or um, how God wants me to use my gifts um, number one God gave you gifts actually you know sometimes people don't believe that Pe people especially in, my, in English people are terrible at that <gasps> oh God God hasn't given me any gifts but he has he has <laughs> so God has given you gifts. That, that could be a major point for some people. Really? <laughs> yes! Wow! Ding! God gave you gifts to use. Wow! So you just, yeah, they're, they're not trophies, they're tools. It's not a badge to wear. It's something to use. God gives you gifts for the benefit of the body. I'm not a pastor. No, but God has given you gifts to build up the church. Me? Yes. Really? Yes. Yeah. Now, what's right about this outline? It's personal. It is practical. And it's God-centered. Well, it has to be because God's the giver of the gifts. It all comes from him. It's the Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the context in Corinthians 12. Can you see that? Now, the academic outline describes the text, but we want to do more than that. It's not a Bible lecture. We're, we're taking God's word and people's need, and we want to root it in application. Um, here's another one. 1 Corinthians 13. Love. Okay. A more excellent way. It's ministry of healing, it's simplicity of language, it's competency for problem solving, it's superiority of value. Now, how can you speak about <laughs> love like that? That's like turning wine into water. Incidentally, we're really good at that as a church. The church on the whole is really expert at turning God's wine into water. Okay, but frankly, I always say this at a wedding. I say, wow, we come here and uh, they might be unchurched people. It doesn't really matter. And I said, God is interested in you. And look at this. At this wedding, God turned water into wine. Isn't that good news? And I'm looking at the father, the bride, who's paying for the wedding. And he's saying, yes, it is. Wow, wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> so we just need to get into this mindset. The gospel is about turning water into wine. But, okay, what's wrong with that outline? It uses complex language, it uses incomplete sentences, and it's passive. Here's, here's, here's another way of doing it. Um, how your love can change others. Number one, your love heals. Two, your love speaks. 
your love can solve problems, your love is of great value. It's just, it's application, isn't it? Warren Wearsby, um, Warren Wearsby, the um, B commentary series, have you seen those little ones? They're really quite good, very um, application based. This is what he says, after 40 years of preaching, the way I approach a sermon has changed. I used to concentrate on what the text says, how I could make it mean something to somebody else. Now I ask, what does God want these people to hear? Duh. Doesn't, isn't that obvious? My preaching was academic. Now it's more personal. Everybody I talk to carries some pain. Woe to that church that doesn't recognize people's needs. And then finally, suggest a practical assignment. The thing which is exercising us as a staff team, and I know a lot of churches think a lot about this, how can we measure and track spiritual growth? That's a good one, isn't it? How can you, how can you measure spiritual growth? Um, and we've had lots of long discussions about that. And maybe when, when we're thinking about preaching, I, I, lo I love to do this. I love to suggest a practical assignment at the end. You know, as a result of this, um, I, I might say um, it might be something as simple as uh, if you've responded, come and see me afterwards and I'll pray for you. Or you might want to get prayer for this. Or you might want to, to read a book. Here's a book. Or you might need to ask forgiveness for someone. Or there is something practical. I, I can't always do that, but it's quite a good way of... Here's a way you can respond. Smart assignments. You, you've, you've heard this before, haven't you? Smart. Specific. Motivational attainable, relevant, and trackable. You can't always do this, but, but sometimes you, you can say there, there are things you can do, you can respond to. I, I actually, in, in my church, I, I, we, we do kind of uh, message outline notes. Um, so when someone comes in, and, and sometimes um, what I've done recently, I've, if people want to, to take this further, I, I put some questions they can think about, they can take this away and use it during the week. There might be some articles to look up online, it's just a bit of a takeaway thing, yeah? Uh, but but I, I can do that, I'm in a settled situation. <laughs>